have a photo booth outside in the foyer area. Please, please make use of it, of it in the lunch time to get yourself clicked and you can collect the photograph as well as a small souvenir towards the end of the conference. Moving on to the second panel discussion of the day, innovations in cybersecurity. The session will witness the discussions on cyber trends, disruptions to business, business priorities, the debate on control versus innovation, innovations in cyberspace and regulations in response to cyber threats. For this interesting and challenging discussion, we have the moderator of the session, Mr. Sakib Sheikh, Head of Sales and Services, Swift, along with distinguished panel speakers, Mr. Shitangshu Kumar Shur Chaudhary, Honorable Deputy Governor of Bangladesh Bank, Mr. Mrityunjay Mahapatra, Deputy Managing Director and Chief Information Officer, State Bank of India, Mr. Nandkumar Sarvade, Chief Executive Officer, IT Reserve Bank of India, Mr. Jitesh Shah, Principal Boston Consulting Group, and Dr. Sanjay Behel, Doc Director General, India Cert. Over to you, Saki. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much, Richard. So, thank you very much for joining us. I'm personally very excited about this panel for two specific reasons. Um, so, as part of my job, I, I spend time across Asia Pacific speaking at different forums and engaging with clients of SWIFT, talking about cybersecurity, innovation, and what all that's going to look like in the coming years. I think what's very unique about India and the subcontinent is that across the board, across the sector, in the different stakeholders, there's a great deal of alignment that we need an inclusive economy, and we in our hearts believe that Technology as a democratization force will allow us to achieve access to financial services, right? And, and there's a collective alignment and collective effort to drive that. Um, and then when it comes to cybersecurity, to meet the challenges of cybersecurity, there's also general alignment as to how to approach that uh, and how to deal with that threat, right? And, and the second reason is we have representatives from the regulator, we have representatives from, from uh, Premier Bank in India, um, and from our management consulting partner um, from BCG. And you, you represent that broad view across the sector. Uh, and you're leaders in your respective areas, but you're also opinion leaders in my view. And people take cue from you uh, as to how to deal with these issues. So I'm very eager to hear, hear your perspectives. Um, to seed the conversation, let me just refer to a few data points to set the context and then we'll get into a discussion and towards the end if we have time we'll open it up for q a because i'm sure a lot of people have questions about this so just a few observations i want to make right when when people think about cybersecurity, a lot of times they're thinking about what is the direct cost of an incident were it to happen to my institution so if there's a payments fraud um, how much money am I going to lose to make my client whole or to cover the financial losses associated with that? That's a, an area of concern, of course, but what people are also not mindful of, and I think this slide speaks to, is that there's a lot of value creation at risk as a consequence of cyber fraud. So this slide is, sh is showing the results of a study that was com uh, commissioned by the World Economic Forum that said that by 2020, technology is going to create $20 trillion in value. And about 15 to 20% of that, or, th or $3 trillion, is at risk. Value creation is at risk directly because of cyber threats. And why is that? It's because of one, lost productivity in the front line. So because we have to constrain data, we have to constrain access, we have to put in security controls in place, the frontline staff are losing productivity as a consequence of that. Um, there's reduced capital and resources that you can allocate to business initiatives because now you have to invest towards control and safety. Um, and then there's a hesitation to adopt new technologies, distributed uh, ledger technologies, artificial intelligence, um, whatever that next frontier of technology is, people become hesitant in adopting that because they say, you know what, I'm not sure what is the consequence of this? What, what, what's the new attack surface that emerges from this? And what's that going to mean to my institution? I'd rather wait and see, right? All that leads to a loss in value creation. Um, and, and sometimes people are not mindful of that. That I found particularly interesting. 
These two charts from a, from a McKinsey study I also found very interesting is that while we had technology driving innovation in the 90s, the cyber threats that emerged as a consequence of that only started having an impact and people be started becoming aware of it around 2007. And the initial reaction was to treat it as an IT function problem and in the domain of the engineers within the bank and the financial sector. Um, and, and as a consequence, we got this very heavy and cumbersome control regime. You can do this, you cannot do this, and we should all measure against what we can and cannot do. And a lot of investment was made towards that. More recently, people are realizing this is not just an IT problem, right? This is a business problem fundamentally. It should have visibility of the executive, it should have visibility of the board, and it needs to be treated as an enterprise risk, and it should be treated as an enterprise risk function. So there's, a, there's an evolution of maturity that's happening in the industry. Some people are better than others, uh, and a lot of people are catching up. The chart on the right is trying to show what is the IT spend towards cybersecurity versus the maturity of the institutions. And it's a mixed bag. Some people are throwing money at the problem, and, and eight to nine percent of their entire IT spend is towards securing their services. But in terms of maturity, they're not mature. Right? So clearly, IT spend is not a measure of success in managing cybersecurity. There are others that are spending far less, and they are more effective, they're more mature. So they're, they're squeezing more efficiency out of that capital in making their services secure. And the experience in the India market is not very different. So this slide is showing you the results of a survey of 124 executives from institutions in India. And it's, it's really, really insightful. On the far left-hand side, 69% of the institutions surveyed said, we're spending more towards cybersecurity. It's an area of focus for us. We need to be mindful of it, so we're going to spend more money towards that. But the consequence of that spending doesn't give a lot of comfort in the end. Only 55% uh, oh, sorry, 55% of institutions said they don't have a formal threat intelligence program. 44% said they don't have a way of identifying vulnerabilities within their environment. 33% don't have a security function within their operations team. And 75%, the majority of people surveyed, said that cybersecurity as a function within their institution does not meet the need of the organization. So more spend, probably not in the right area, and it's not giving a lot of comfort, yeah? So that's, that's pretty stark. And all of this is happening in an environment where the next frontier of cyber threats is ever more complex, is more intense, and more frequent. So you see attackers originally focused in the retail sector, it was all about ATM fraud and cr uh, credit card fraud and check fraud, moving to areas where there are larger pools of critical data and liquidity, which is now the banks. Right? It could eventually project out to the payment systems. Um, because of the interdependency of our, of our systems, the connectivity, there's a risk of contagion, a contagion effect that can happen. Um, there's so much cyber intelligence that's out there. Um, if you're subscribed to Microsoft or HP or Oracle or these major vendors, they're pushing out so much intelligence, and Swift is doing the same. It's very confusing for an institution to digest all that, make sense of it, what does it mean for me, what action do I need to take today to protect my assets, all that can be very overwhelming. And then, the, I, I don't want to talk about all of them, but the last one I'll talk about is unmanaged devices in the enterprise. So we've all become very mindful of locking down our PCs, so you cannot put in USB sticks into systems, the Bluetooth doesn't work, the Wi-Fi only works with our corporate uh, networks, but at the same time, my iPhone's over there, I'm walking into my office, into my enterprise, with an iPhone. It has a microphone, it has a camera, and we know there are malwares out there that start recording without your knowledge, right? So unmanaged devices within the enterprise is a source of risk that we're all gonna have to deal with. So that was just a quick view on where, what is at risk, three trillion dollars, um, where the spend is happening, it's not necessarily yielding comfort. And then there's these emerging threats that are very complex for people to understand and deal with. Um, so with that introduction, if it's okay, I'll turn it over to the panelists. That's a lot of food for thought. Um, to, to go through some of the questions that we thought would be relevant for the, for the panel. 
So the first one, if I, if I may start with uh, uh, Dr. Bell, is about cyber trends. So in India and the subcontinent, in the financial services sector, where do you see the trends in cyber threat? Where are they coming from? Where are they headed? And how do we manage for that? Uh, thank you. Uh, I thought you said I've given you a lot, a lot of food for thought. So I was just wondering, after this session, do we have lunch break or we don't have a lunch break? <laughs> uh, uh, I was listening to some of the uh, speakers in the earlier sessions and uh, very clearly what was coming out is that we moved into a technology-based globalized economy. So when you break that up, what does it mean? You're going to have technology risks as well as you're going to have process risks. And one of the speakers mentioned that we've automated most of our uh, current manual processes and now they are digitized. So the moment you have those digitized, your process risks are going to actually increase because you only automated what was there in the physical world into the digital world and with the assumption that the digital world will still keep working the way the physical world was working. But that's not how it is working. The digital world is working in a very different fashion, so you need different processes. And that's where the problem and challenges start coming. So the moment you have something of that sort, what does it bring about? It brings about business risks. The moment you have business risks, it leads to cases of fraud and crime. So we've not yet come to cyber incidents. It's leading to frauds and crimes. And that's why you're seeing a whole lot of that happening at this point in time. And this fraud and crime happens because the malicious actors understand that you have only automated your existing processes. And they, they know where the loopholes are, what the gaps are, and they are able to penetrate. In addition, they also understand the technology side. And based on where they are able to enter from the process side, at the technology level they start understanding what are the vulnerabilities which are already inherent, what need to be exploited. They use different techniques and tactics and start exploiting that. And then you come towards multiple attack vectors which are leading to cyber threats. And then that impacts your assets. So if you uh, look at it from a generic India perspective, today we still have many unknown vulnerabilities. Incidents are spreading at network speed. Uh, many attacks are still being undetected. You did talk about a lot of money being spent on different technologies, but this is not a technology issue. So it's, you can keep spending a lot of money, that does not mean that you'll be able to safeguard yourselves. There's a whole uh, holistic approach that is required. And the other thing is that everyone is independently trying to safeguard or defend their systems. There is no cooperation and coordinated approach which is being taken. So when you look at things specifically from the banking and financial sector perspective, uh, based on some of the incidents that we've been looking at. Uh, there's manipulation of ATMs through malware and also by installing hidden cameras. There are attacks on payment gateways. There are targeted attacks on bank employees. And then there's lateral movement to reach critical backend systems including global settlement systems. There is ransomware, which is impacting complete networks as well as critical databases. There is distributed denial of service attacks, which are demanding extortion uh, from various uh, banks, etc. And also, there is this delivery of e-commerce services by small and medium businesses through insecure websites. Also, when you start analyzing a little more 
in terms of what has been reported to us, I can broadly bucket them into three categories. There are phishing attacks, there are malware and ransom attacks, and the third is there are rogue mobile apps. So when you look at this sort of a trend, it is primarily targeted towards the end users. And end users are primarily targeted because they are not aware and educated enough to understand what the issue is, what they need to do. So basically the focus is towards monetization and committing these sort of frauds as I mentioned. If you look at it, how it is going to go forward, definitely there will be much more distributed denial of service attacks, so that services are not available. Uh, malware attacks in terms of ransomware is going to become more rampant. There will be more targeted attacks. There will be attacks on the supply chain, uh, which will cause disruptions. The other thing uh, that you'll see is, of course, uh, network level and application level attacks will continue. Uh, primarily the focus is to create ina inaccuracy, uh, exfiltration of data and uh, denial of service. But also at the human level, uh, these attacks will continue. And these are the ones which will create that fear, uncertainty, doubt in their minds, reputation loss and alter their behavior, that like right now you're trying to push them towards digitization and use digital technologies. But the moment they lose trust in this, they will want to go back to the old system. So can you afford that? So you need to start thinking as to what you need to do to make sure that the malicious actors do not alter this behavior and you are above them to make sure that the behavior and trust of users is intact and they move towards the path that you have already taken. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for that. You made a very interesting point. The spend is, is not necessarily, or should not necessarily be towards technology, because technology is not the issue at stake here. I guess what you're intending to say that it should, it's, it's equally, it's not the only issue, it's equally a people issue, right? Yeah, it's a people, process, technology, governance, uh, architecture, human factors, culture. It's, it's multiple factors that need to be looked at. So when you look at it holistically, you need to address each of these issues because each of these issues need to be at the same maturity level if you want to go forward. Today what you have is all of them are at extremely different maturity levels and hence you are not able to see uh, what you are intending to see. And that's why you have gaps and falls. And, and yes, the, as you said, the complexity has increased. The moment complexity increases, the attack surface increases. So, so you need to be mindful of all these factors. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Chaudhary, if, if I may ask you, I think Bangladesh is in a very similar digitization journey to India, right? You have mobile wallets that are emerging, investment in low-value payments and, and clearing systems. Um, what are the trends in your market? What do you see? Is it this very much the same as India or is it different? I think the problem is almost the same. And these sort of problems are existing in case of Bangladesh. Although the Bangladesh is uh, proceeding towards the digitization and it is the, uh, the agenda of the government to turn the country into the digitized country. And um, the, the digitization not only took place in the banks and financial institution system, but it also took place in the government departments and uh, ministries also. For example, all sort of recruitment, procurement, tendering, etc., are being digitized now. We are doing all these, these online systems. But everywhere, these risks is emerging because Particularly in the banks and financial sector, the scenario is same. This malware attack or the phishing or the, uh, this sort of uh, internet of things use, uh, artificial uh, intelligence use, these are the common uh, problem. Uh, but the digitization demand from the customer side cannot be averted because until and unless technology 
uh, develops and new products comes into the market, the business will not survive. And the business demand is very high. And uh, the, the banks and financial institutions, they are in the fiercely competitive design. Every bank and financial institutions are competing with each other that they are very much under the heavy pressure for the new product. But before launching the new product, I think everyone should take care of it, whether it is uh, the uh, free firm. At least uh, you cannot eliminate the risks, but the risks can be mitigated. So these, uh, the loopholes does not so that exist before. In, in case of Bangladesh, we have introduced, we, in Bangladesh Bank, the central bank of the country has uh, just opened a new, established a new section in our regulation department because before introducing any new product, you have to report and take permission from the central bank only because of this security measure. Whether you have, you have launched the, prog the product, that's good. But, and it, you, will, you have digitized this, that's also good. But whether this is uh, the secured or not, whether any loopholes or not, any malware attack or the disease, uh, or these loopholes can perish this system, which will perish the business cases also. And because business uh, is not fast, compliance is fast. So we are attaching much more importance on the compliance uh, because compliance is fast. So that will come to uh, the next discussion. But the problems which has been discussed by our honorable panelist, uh, it is all, I, I fully agree that these are almost the same in the neighboring countries like in the economy of Bangladesh also. Mr. Sarvade, I'm curious from a Reserve Bank of India perspective, you, you, the Reserve Bank made, makes significant investments in educating the banking sector in India to make sure that they, that they are efficient, that they are safe, that they adopt the next generation of technologies to drive that inclus inclusive agenda that we have, right? When it comes to cyber, um, where should we be mindful? I mean, what are the trends, what are the next set of risks that we should be mindful of? And how is the Reserve Bank helping in educating towards that and managing that risk? Right, so uh, sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not uh, going to be talking about what Reserve Bank thinks because I have no mandate to talk about that. I'm uh, representing myself as a some curious student of this particular subject, and so no remarks should be attributed to being from coming from a regulator. Uh, we I'm currently we are trying to build up a, a technology company which will support Reserve Bank's mandate. So that is a caveat. But I think uh, the points which you presented in the slides and the speakers have been making are of common interest. So there's no uh, whichever direction you approach it from, the problems are not going to be substantially different because they are sitting in the middle and uh, they, are, they are very large problems. So I would like to just look at it from what Mr. Bell said, people process technology kind of approach. I think uh, that's a good approach to take because uh, ultimately banking has become a technology business and uh, many people are uh, complaining that you know it's no longer old banking, uh, it's all technology people trying to run banking and so on. And uh, Bill Gates quote that uh, banking will remain, but banks may not, keeps getting quoted to us all the time. Now, that being the case, I think the developments in technology become very important. And these developments are all around us, so I don't have to recount them. Uh, particularly in the Indian context, I think digitization is a big drive. Uh, all organizations are grappling with it. Uh, mo mobile has become a very important factor in financial inclusion and a new payment mechanisms which will leapfrog the traditional <coughs> cost barriers of trying to roll out something which will uh, reach the entire country far and wide. And <clears throat> with those technologies will come the risks which are inherent in any evolving technology. So as we know, mobile technology has been uh, undergoing such a rapid change that it is difficult to even un understand where it is going and what kind of risks it is introducing already, it has introduced already. Platforms are getting constructed to take advantage of this technology and those platforms will see some uh, process of coming to a stage of maturity before you know they become fully secure or reasonably secure, if I can say that. I think it's an evolving process, so I don't think we should worry too much about uh, 
technology uh, change, it has to be accepted and all organizations need to have processes uh, to deal with that change. Uh, of course, there are already talks of uh, blockchain being the new kid on the block, if I can use the term, and transforming banking again. Uh, I think, uh, frankly, I, I don't have full understanding of blockchain technology itself, but it is supposed to be transforming and, uh, a, you know, all proof of concept kind of projects are already off the ground and more and more will come We from the Reserve Bank IT. We are also interested in these kind of projects and hopefully we'll be able to work on this soon. So that is about technology and I think Internet of Things Mr. Uh, uh, Chaudhary mentioned in his uh, 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 remarks, uh, banks traditionally being very conservative about technology, probably we'll see that happening sooner or later, but I think uh, a lot of drive will come from the customer side itself to see uh, how this can be integrated into banking offerings. Well, coming to the uh, second factor, which is often missed uh, in cybersecurity, uh, there's an adversary in, in this problem, which is not there in most technology problems that are getting uh, addressed. And these adversaries are uh, technology have as knowledgeable as the people who are trying to build technology and they can uh, network better, they are able to, uh, uh, you know, think of big plans. If you have seen the movie, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Batman movies, the character of Joker is will what, what you will come to your mind. The kind of deviousness and the kind of innovation and ingenuity these kind of characters display, uh, it is not very easy to replicate uh, in from the defending side. Uh, just to give an example of, uh, you know, how this ecosystem has been evolving, as we all know, uh, all criminal services are getting commoditized and are on offer to whoever wants to pay for them. Uh, ransomware can be uh, customized, uh, DDoS bots are available, uh, and so on. And to top it all, Bitcoin is available as a medium of exchange when, uh, when value has to be transferred. I recently read that uh, Bitcoin has just topped one billion dollars in, uh, in in criminal activity. That's where there's the volume of uh, uh, criminal activity, ransomware, ransom being paid, and so on. So this ecosystem is very strong. And believe you me, uh, I have been in law enforcement for a long time. Law enforcement is not prepared to deal with this criminal activity at all because it happens across the borders. The protocols for international cooperation on investigation in real time are not there at all. And locally also, if there is a uh, completely local transaction, even then, if it is across the state border and so on, you will see very lethargic response from law enforcement. So we are looking at uh, ecosystem which favors the attacker. Take the example of the Brazil Bank uh, news which came just yesterday. Completely audacious in its scope uh, to take over a bank, its entire system, uh, for a few hours by hatching a plan which went back six months when a certificate was obtained fraudulently and then the DNS records were changed and the bank was not even able to send mails to its customers saying that our systems are down or please don't transact or whatever. Now this, this is that joker kind of approach where we'll see this more and more because a good attack, good in quotes, will be replicated, believe you me. And uh, you know, it just takes either a vulnerability, technology vulnerability or a human being pressurized or bribed to introduce something in a network which can then be attacked. So this is the adversary factor which I'm talking about. This is often not really understood well, but it is required to be kept in mind. The third point I wanted to mention was about the people aspect. And I'm not going to touch processes because I think in my opinion, processes are there. If you want to adopt those processes, those frameworks, those are very much available. But what you don't have, especially in the Indian banking sector, is enough people who can operate those processes, who can understand those frameworks and adopt them internally. And I think this people aspect is often missed because, uh, you know, it just become a board level problem. So I think boards are starting to think about it. But the supply of security professionals is severely limited. Second, security is often seen as a secondary career. People come to security from other directions, from IT operations, from compliance, from various other things. And uh, it takes a while to understand the systems and the flaws in the systems and the motivations of people exploiting those flaws. So security takes a aptitude and experience and training to really make a career out of those career paths hopefully will emerge but as of now I think there is going to be severe shortage of security uh, skill sets in India the other thing we constantly see is the models for uh, compensation models for hiring such uh, skill sets laterally are missing in many banks 
uh, the work culture is not conducive to thinking very, you know, uh, very rapidly uh, re responding to the threats. And then there is a siloed approach. Even if you have best skill sets, if the skill sets are not combining with each other, then you don't get the result. Uh, typically, to give an example, in security, we, you have many banks of fraud teams, which often see the problem at its leading edge, because debit card transactions are happening, getting disputed, there's a pattern building up, you know, not all banks can see the pattern because it, it requires a clearing house level view to see that pattern. And that is where if uh, early exchange of information is there, then you can start identifying the problem. Fraud teams are there in some banks, they are not there in many banks. So fraud as a problem is not even measured by many banks to identify it too early. Then application development, technology audits, many banks don't have technology audit departments. They don't benefit from internal review of what can uh, be introduced in the technology implementation process. And these kind of silos, some silos are missing, but even if they are there, they don't talk sufficiently to each other to then be at the right at the, uh, you know, at the cutting edge of dealing with this threat. So I think these three points, technology rapid change, uh, very uh, capable adversary, and the lack of uh, right skill sets is what I would like to highlight as Great. trends. Thank you very much. Mr. Shah, so you're dealing with different types of institutions large, small, servicing different types of clients, public sector, private sector. If I summarize what I'm hearing from the other panelists with regards to trends, banking is fundamentally is changing the way it's servicing its clients, right? You have mo mobility, you have mobile devices with which to access services of the bank, you have interconnectedness as a consequence of that mobility, and you have access to large computing power, right? Y your device is a window to a lot of computing power. Um, and then there's data at risk in that entire chain, right? There's data on the device, which is at rest and at execution. There's data in motion. Um, and in banking, data essentially equates to liquidity, right? Because data triggers the movement of liquidity. Um, where are the, the threats emerging in that chain? And how are the different institutions that you deal with, how are they reacting to that? Um, so there are institutions are sitting at a very large end of spectrum. It starts from audit and control at one end to uh, detection of what has happened uh, in terms of cyber attack at, uh, you know, in the middle. And then the other extreme is prevention. Now, the evolution and maturity of what banks are doing is a function of how long have they been in the digital journey. And while a part of digital journey is customer facing and employee facing, uh, the bigger risk is also because there are a large, large number of connected stakeholders like vendors. Uh, like people going to Facebook and you know, social media and offering banking services there. It exposes the banks not to just their own risks, but also the, connected, the risk of being connectedness. So just in terms of stats, 50% of threats last year originated from mobile. Uh, about two thirds of the threat came from ecosystem. Uh, and they, you know, they, these are overlapping. But uh, a large number of threats essentially are, are happening outside control of the bank. And as long as banks are not going down the curve of being able to detect this at the right stage and being able to prevent it even before it happens, uh, we will always be in this audit and control mode. Uh, and what we have seen is some of, the some of the banks which have made the journey start early are able to therefore do a good job of at least detecting it at the right time and taking a preactive uh, preventive measure. And then eventually now they're investing a lot of uh, dollars behind uh, technology which is able to prevent it, is able to detect it early enough and prevent it. Great, thank you very much for that. M Mr. Mahapatra, you lead the information technology function of one of the premier banks of India. You're also on the board of many companies, right? Cyber can be a big distraction to the business. The business wants to get on with the services that it wants to provide. They want to service their clients in the most effective way, having enriching experiences and delighting their customers. Um, how, how, do sh how should a business make sense of this? And how should they prioritize cyber versus everything else that they have to do? I think uh, uh, as a practitioner, as someone who lives with this, uh, I'll, I'll give some practical advice. First is that you told why, in spite of investments going up, why we are, uh, why we are unable to you know, be there in terms of maturity. 
a uh, few days back i wrote in economic times and i uh, i i i kind of built this hypothesis is that you know most of us are induced by what i call mannequin driven buying we see a picture in the website or we pass on the high street we see the mannequin wearing a dress we believe that that dress will fit as well so vendors and you know people who are in the security industry are inducing players like banks and insurance companies to make an investments which may not be appropriate as a result what is going forward what is happening is that people are unable to deploy them smartly people are unable to sweat those assets and the security maturity level doesn't move so the first thing is that developing a capability to choose what is appropriate for you as they call fit for purpose if your payment gateway is as large as state bank of india if it handles 40% of country's uh, you know payment traffic then obviously you will have to go at the cutting edge but even in state bank of india we find that deployment is a challenge procurement is a challenge customization is a challenge so a project management approach needs to be there people must understand what are the outcomes now business let us i think i believe and i have implemented it with uh, a lot of uh, you know good results is that mapping business outcome to a security implementation all of us know here that you know uh, many times the level of security is inversely proportional to user experience i can deploy a lot of security but my users will run away to a simpler intuitive kind of user experience so if that happens then what is what is the fun of having a security for security sake so how do i how do i continuously optimize my security deployment to what i am doing second is that you know innovations which we are doing one is around community policing you know many times it is not possible to do or deploy things all alone so how can we build first informally and if possible formally with uh, you know people like certain or people like reserve bank of india because they are also on a learning curve as mr sarbari rightly told so as all of us learn regulators government players all of us learn i think community policing and community awareness is more important second thing that the that we are doing is you know encouraging people to whistle blow and ethically hack because again data shows that 90% of the hacking 90% of the cyber is done by insider either lazily or collusively so if that be so then we must have reward and recognition aligned towards whistle blowing ethical hacking or internal hacking competition which i have you know put that yes you guys know it you do it and so it to me i'll give it to your reward i will make the dr region or the test region available to you to come and bring down the system so this is also working third thing that is working is is probably deployment of some level of analytics gone are the days when you will ask someone to give you broad statistics what is happening in your own organization again as i told you don't get swayed by what is happening globally it is not a question of what but which and when cyber security is important i think everybody understands cyber security can bring down your business everybody understand there are multiple hops through which service is getting delivered because in a platform kind of economy you know your banking service is delivered through four different uh, you know uh, partners three different vendors two different hops five different gateways three different systems all these are given but what is appropriate for you is to keep on doing this feedback loop where people 
culturally will accept that cyber needs to be at the center, not around the IT. So bringing this cultural change requires both, both post facto analysis and on the go analytics. And trust me, it is simple. It is no rocket science. Begin somewhere. Don't wait till things come to a shape where you can be equivalent to the best in the world. It will never happen. So what we have done in State Bank of India is that, you know, encourage the analytics department to look into incident logs. Find out what is there. Program it into an artificial intelligence a little bit. And this journey has been very fruitful. So I give you some practical examples how we should deal with it. Thank you very much for that. If I could ask a follow-on question, because you touched on it and I think it's very important. Um, the, the, one of the topics of, the, of this uh, conference is innovation, right? And to be innovative in financial services or any other sector, you need to be willing to take risk. You need to be quick to market. You need to m make bets and sometimes big bets in technologies that may not be uh, homogeneous with what you have used in the past, your people are familiar with, that type of thing. How do you balance that with the need to have safety and security, especially vis-a-vis -vis your core services? Um, so how have you dealt with that in the past? See, there are two ways of doing it. One is that the risk of authorizing an investment. Many times, you know, because boards themselves are either unaware or they have not been hit in the face with an incident, they are not authorizing, you know, futuristic investments. They believe that, yes, this much should be enough. What is going on, nobody knows. Everything goes into that black box called security preparedness and things are happening. I think uh, that attitudinal risk has to be taken, that we have to invest futuristically in, 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 in technology process and people. Second is, is, is the collaboration. You know, there are uh, a number of startups which we have engaged with a with lot of benefits. Many times they will not give you any, any, any kind of endpoint solution. But these guys are amazing people. You know, what they are doing is that they pick up, unlike a State Bank of India, which is to deal with 50 cyber-related problems at once, these guys are picking up one problem and try, trying to, you know, slice it, dissect it, bisect it, and trying to come out with things. So, the ecosystem of dealing with security, both in terms of defending and preparing, has to go beyond the boundaries of the organization. And third thing, as you told about innovation. See, innovation, many times we again wait for big innovation, the incremental innovations, like how do you change the process slightly? I'll give you one example. You know, my security operations center, where, which is probably India's only, uh, you know, ISO certified security operations center, which has 30, 40 people looking at the traffic all the time, stopping the traffic. The security operations center, if it is real time integrated with, with my command center, where other application uptime is happening, we found tremendous amount of intelligence coming in from my command center, which is watching my applications. Whereas security operations center, typically watching at traffic, watching at, you know, things that are hitting my firewall. As compared to that, the moment you do an incremental innovation of putting those small IoT, small artifacts at the command center, which will give feeds to the security operations center, suddenly I have a bigger canvas. So keep on looking for opportunities. As I told, don't think that anybody will come and give you a magic potion to make you young. It doesn't happen in real world. I think uh, philosophically, a risk-based approach is what will work the best. If you understand the risks well, and for that you need again the right kind of people who are constantly measuring the risk and then relating it to the, your business environment, then you will be able to take that risk if the reward, risk reward ratio is uh, appropriate. Just giving an example, recently, and I'm using again information in public domain, uh, there was a case of uh, what is known as ATM jackpotting attack. So in one ATM or a few ATMs in a particular state, uh, they got attacked. Uh, what was happening was they are ATMs, as you know, 70% ATMs run on Windows XP or more, uh, depending on which data you are looking at. 
these ATMs are vulnerable to certain malware which works in that operating system. Now somebody goes there, puts a USB drive, it is not disabled, boots the ATM, puts the malware and the ATM then just dispenses cash. Now this has been a known problem. Windows XP upgradation is a known problem. I'm sure all of you have been uh, working out the uh, financial equations. Obviously, there is a cost to upgradation and then the risk is very much there. Now, risk is that if this attack escalates, it goes to all ATMs which are running Windows XP, you have a very large attack surface, lo lo lot of value at risk. But, and I'm not a technical person uh, who can authoritatively comment on this. Somebody mentioned that if the BIOS can be locked down, and USB can be locked down, you don't have to upgrade the OS. Now, it is a choice you have to make based on risk evaluation that you can do, and probably your technical team can do that evaluation, and then you can still take the risk saying that I will not upgrade, I will just do this much and that's it. So that is the risk-based approach that I, I think would be more uh, beneficial. Excellent, thank you for that. Mr. Shah, if I may ask you, there's so many vendors out there that are peddling very flashy services, very flashy products, right? Um, and that's coming on top of all the other business that they're trying to pitch to you to help you drive your own business agenda, right? How do we partner with them effectively? And what are the areas of partnership? And how do you measure uh, success from that partnership? Um, <clears throat> uh, most panelists here have mentioned that it is important to have the right people skills in the organization to be able to work on this topic. Uh, because many in India are still going down this path of learning and building capability. Very often, uh, I think the example given was a mannequin wearing some dress. It, is, it very often happens that vendors come through jargons, uh, then they will have a special consultant or a, or a, a specialist who will evaluate what is being offered uh, and, and, and basis the judgment of a specialist. A call would be taken to invest a you know, significant amount of dollars behind the security uh, software. Uh, so I think two things need to happen in parallel. Uh, if banks need to up their ante on security, A, they will have to build in the, in the medium to long term people skills in-house. Uh, and you know, there was the reference of uh, lateral hiring at the right scale. It, it, it involves a large number of HR issues that need to be solved. Uh, they need to be give, provide the right environment to be able to grow in the organization at the same time, uh, given a free hand to eventually work. That's, that's the first thing that the banks should do in the medium to long term. In the short term, there are multiple frameworks which are available, which can help you evaluate what is right for you. Uh, very often what, what, what happens is institutions take a enterprise and enterprise view only when implementing a security. But it has to become almost part of every solution rhythm. That for each solution. This is our experience, I can tell you. Sure. See, this uh, collaboration is also completely dependent on trust. You know, if you don't have trust, the collaboration does not happen. Uh, so, one of the other examples, if I have to give you uh, in terms of collaboration that we've been able to implement is uh, the Cyber Swachta Kendra, which we launched uh, on the 21st of February. Uh, this is a collaboration between the academia, between the ISPs, between the antivirus vendors and the government. Okay, uh, basically we're trying to extend the Swachta Abhyan from the physical space to the cyber space. Uh, because of the botnets and malwares which are there. Uh, and apart from these players who are collaborating, the banks are also collaborating because what we are looking at is the malicious traffic which is flowing through the different I I IPs, uh, which are then passed on to the ISPs to figure out who are the appropriate users behind it. And then there are free tools available on the portal at the Cyber Swachta Kendra where people can download and clean their devices. Uh, same way the banks are now collaborating by giving their range of IP addresses. And uh, we can tell them that these are your specific IP addresses uh, which are uh, emanating, uh, you know, Mal malware traffic and uh, they can then go behind and see who are the people or which are the devices and then they are cleaning that up. So, so the antivirus vendors are collaborating by giving tools which are going to be useful to make sure that the devices remain clean. So there is no identity theft, etc. Uh, the academia is looking at it to make sure that they tell us what are the new 
threats which are emanating out of it as well as uh, trying to uh, give some new uh, you know signatures to the malware vendors to make sure that they have uh, quick signatures available from a zero day attack perspective etc the government is participating in this as a community service for the citizens and the ISPs are collaborating, the banks are collaborating. So, you know, there are different, as I said, different mechanisms of collaboration, but it all depends on the trust factor and how much trust you've been able to build with everyone. So, but there are good practical examples, scalable examples, uh, which can be implemented. See, uh, uh, collaboration is often confused as only external collaboration. Let's say you take a large organization, uh, the charity must begin at home. The siloed approach inside organizations is often the reason for vulnerabilities coming in. For example, uh, you, know, you will not find that in security matters because uh, uh, what we do is that uh, we, we, uh, we try to approach all the three lines of defense the policy and processes in the front, the analytics and the mid-office in the middle, and of course the last line of defense is audit and you know, quality assurance. Now when there are all these three lines of defense have to work in unison to, to get you uh, the results, many times what happens is the development wing is not collaborating with the testing wing, the analytic wing is not collaborating with the security wing, the security wing uh, is often perceived as a nuisance. The business believes that so internal collaboration and another thing which is very important is that all of us spoke about tools and uh, um, you know methods to protect security. But I believe first what has to come in is a framework. Frameworks could be RBI's framework, could be COBIT, could be Basel. You know, there are many frameworks which are available, which you know, is like not reinventing the wheel. It has given a master list of what all to be done. And you apply it and wherever automation is required, wherever connection is required, you'll have to do it. But a senior empowered group of people must look at bringing in the appropriate parts of already established frameworks into the organization so that cyber security takes a firm foundation. Otherwise, cybersecurity will be here, there, here, everywhere. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think we wanted to give uh, the audience an opportunity to ask questions, yeah, because uh, you have some very unique people on the panel. But if I could just summarize my key takeaways. So cyber is not abstract, it's real, it's having an impact today. There's a way to deal with it. You have to be mindful, you have to be systematic and forward-looking. Um, there, there is a balance to be struck between innovation and speed and being safe and secure, but there's a way to tackle that problem. And there's a need for collaboration. And you said it best, collaboration begins at home, right? Within the silos of our organization and then the external parties. So I think that was very, very insightful. Thank you so much. Um, if there are any questions from the audience, we can take them now. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. I'm Indra from Tata Consultancy, and thanks for uh, this pretty insightful elaboration. My question is very simple. See, in a business sense, security is considered non financial even if it is having financial consequences, and that figure has been indicated. Uh, Mr. Mahapatra spoke about uh, BIS framework or the guidance. In fact, uh, CPMI, the Committee on Payment and Mar Market Infrastructure, they came up with the guidance. My question is, is there any you know, like, uh, kind of public information tracking the same way what is being done for capital and risk management part as a part of Basel 3 or Basel 2 and half or Basel 2 or whatnot? So are we comparing or taking at the same level or this is just a like a post facto reaction or audit you know, like kind of exercise. The, that's the kind of the attitudinal part that is also coming as a part of you know, like some of the comments. So that's my question. Is there any kind of like a proactive elaborate kind of like this governance and the framework which is taking care of uh, how to tackle 
how to plan, how to react, cyber security, or it is mostly in the back office? I think it's a good question, uh, and probably it echoes what I told, that uh, that cyber incidents will happen is a given. So, yes, you will keep on getting prepared, but uh, whoever is the hacker or whoever is the perpetrator of a fraud has that element of surprise with him, has that element of hitting at any point at will that is with him. So what we have done, I'll tell you, one is that, you know, formation of war room process. At what level of service downtime that war room preparedness must be there? What is the proper place where war room must be there? What is the connection that it must have? What is the escalation matrix? That must be, you know, that is, that is, we have again, we have invented by iteration, yes indeed, probably not known to public, we have faced a couple of downtimes. When we found that, we run like headless chicken when something, uh, you know, hits us. So, stabilizing a war room process, how do you, you know, aggregate the war room very quickly, whether the necessary tools are there like video conferencing, like, you know, feeds from, uh, you know, monitoring, like how the, uh, you know, database logs will come and how the advanced customer support uh, regime will kick in, all those things are very important. Second thing is what we are doing is, uh, as another standard, is secured co coding practices. Secured coding practice could be as simple as, you know, giving a description of a logic in a, in a batch of codes. Many times what happens is that a rogue code comes inside the code quite unintentionally. That fellow didn't uh, understand that this could create a loop and this could create, you know, this could create a problem and it could bring down the application. But he does, he does the second mistake also of not describing the logic as they call it text description. So secure coding practices are many and this is becoming a discipline. And third of course is, you know, it is easier said than done is taking people who, who, will, who will take it. But let me tell you, even if you hire so-called cyber security experts, you may not get someone who is appropriate. I have experimented myself, tried to hire two, three people, you know, bringing them into organizational culture, le letting them understand, because when uh, outsiders come, insiders will want them to fail. So all those, you know, human elements also have to be taken. So to answer to your question, yes, there are framework, but again, it must be customized. Proactiveness is coming in. Reactiveness is also existing. Response time must be better. War room formation is important. Secure coding practices is important. Proactive security audit. We do every product before it goes to production. It goes through a very detailed VAPT. Very, very detailed. But even then, we keep on facing it. So, uh, to address the framework question, uh, so the Gopal Krishna Committee report came out in 2011 and it was uh, released to banks as an advisory, it was not a mandatory piece of uh, regulation. And uh, last year, two th second June 2016, uh, RBI has issued a uh, guidance which is mandatory, which is which has to be followed and it should be audited. Uh, but as Mr. Mahapatra said, the devil is in detail and implementation. So, for example, crisis management plan. Uh, there are many organizations which have crisis management plan, one, once a year exercise, desktop, tabletop exercise, and people sometimes sit, take it from wherever they are sitting on audio and so on. Now, if that is to be done with full seriousness, you have to actually get under the skin of the character that you are trying to play and then take decisions. Uh, some of the recent exercise, one of the recent exercises I was saying, the CISO is using a script <coughs> of running that exercise and there are roles to be played by a BCP person, a corporate communications person, a legal person, those persons are missing in the room. Unless they are there and they act on that script and start thinking about their roles, the crisis management exercise will remain on paper and when actual crisis hits, uh, everybody will be running around like headless chicken to use your graphic phrase. Actually, I think no framework is the final solution. 
but the awareness and commitment of the organization as well as all the employees is very important. And the, always you will have to customize. But my colleague was telling that any outsider and many expert will come and sit in your organization and he will not be able to ensure the safety and soundness of the system. Because there are some problems from inside and from outside and they, he will have to take much more time. But sometimes the consultative efforts may be taken up, but the, the ceaseless efforts on the consciousness, awareness uh, is very much necessary. And you will have to customize all the framework and the standards, whether it is up to the, uh, the organizational standard or the institutional standard, whether it is sufficient enough to combat any sort of attack but still, one thing is to be borne in mind, despite taking all the framework and all these security measures, nobody can predict that this will not happen further. So because the hackers and the IT criminals are more smarter than the business people, that should be borne into mind. Thank you. Hello. Uh, just Small clarification uh, for a small Swift user, I am Vyas from Basin Catholic Cooperative Bank. Uh, there were some confusing uh, reports which we read in newspapers and all those things. There was some breach. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Where, where are you from? Uh, Basin Catholic Cooperative Bank. Uh, uh, there were some confusing uh, news we read, like there was some break in Swift network or sometimes something happened in Bangladesh and then the, luckily it was confirmed that there was no uh, breakup at least in Swift network but something happened. So ultimately what uh, takeaway we should be having as a Swift user, any precautions you would suggest in those circumstances, still we were a little bit confused exactly what has happened. Thank you, sir. So maybe, maybe Sakib, you can answer this. Yeah. So, so I think that's, a, that's a, a good conversation to have. It's going to take a bit of while, so maybe we take it offline. The quick answer. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so rest assured that the Swift messaging platform that's in the cloud has not been compromised. The network that extends from that messaging platform to the different institutions that use the channel has not been compromised. All the risk and the compromise has been on the endpoints, the institutions, the, the, their people, their technology, their processes, and these are advanced persistent threats. To respond to that is what uh, Allah had been referring to, Mr. Nair spoke about a little bit earlier, is the customer security program. So that's a multi-pronged, forward-looking program that's very comprehensive, that's supporting the different institutions that use the channel to make the use of the channel more secure, right? And it talks about all the different things around how the channel should be configured, how you should share information. When you use vendors to implement the channel, are they sufficiently trained? Are they, are they capable of meeting the needs of your institution? It's, it's talking about all of that. And, and certainly we can talk more about it uh, offline. So we've been out of time for a while now. Can I? One, one last question, yes please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Pinaki. I'm a humble trade finance practitioner from Calcutta. My question is, uh, in uh, the 90s, Tarapure committee submitted a report for uh, capital account convertibility. Fortunately, or maybe an act of providence, there was a South Asian meltdown and it was not implemented, even the road map was ready. Looking back, if we had uh, perhaps converted the currency on the capital account, it would have been a disaster because Forex reserve was not very high. Today, you know, hearing all the discussion, we know about Lehman Brothers, how it collapsed, how the major uh, banks collapsed, how, you know, long-term capital management, despite having two Nobel laureates on the board, how it collapsed. Now, something goes wrong, uh, you know, like, do we have the capability or the, are the forex reserves sufficiently high to tackle that kind of a, you know, disaster scenario? Because uh, Honorable Deputy Governor might be knowing, I mean, he can throw light on when the, uh, this Bangladesh bank haste happened how they came out of it. Now, more than the headless chicken, uh, there could be a moment where we'll be trying to find a black cat in a very dark room. So, you know, like, are you ready to cope with that kind of a scenario? Because you have the Minister of State admitting in the parliament that 2.9 million debit cards were compromised. And I understand even the largest bank in the country, they also face the similar problem regarding the debit card. So something goes wrong, God forbid. Are you ready to cope with that kind of a scenario? Thank you, sir. 
I think uh, I can only reiterate what I told that you rightly articulated. Yes, things will happen because, you know, as Murphy's law is there, if things can go wrong, they will. So, uh, how do we respond when things happen? That is what needed to be perfected. No, there are, I mean, just a couple of examples to say that it is not in the realm of imagination anymore. How do we intelligently manage the uh, PR and the DR, production and the DR regime? So that, you know, the rogue uh, program or the rogue attack which is coming to the production doesn't, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, replicate in the disaster recovery region also. Because if one goes down, the second shouldn't go down. The active, active technology. The third thing that is happening is that, you know, we have recovery time objective and RPOs. So how do we manage it? How much is the maximum data loss that when the main system comes down, can we manage it intelligently? Because yesterday I was talking with, you know, uh, virtual uh, uh, VMware uh, 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 top engineers and in, incidentally their CIO is a person from Indian origin called Baskire. So he was mentioning that right now it is possible to have platforms, different platforms for uh, production region and disaster recovery region. One of them could be cloud. And cloud, which has superior and standardized security mechanisms, can prevent probably some of the traffic which could affect the production region. So how do we disaggregate it? So these are things on which we are working in State Bank of India, and I'm sure many of you will be working. So as I told, disaster prevention or minimizing the impact of a disaster or a cyber incident is one of the key architectural principles rather than, you know, completely eliminating it. I think I yeah, it is working. Uh, just want to add to what he has mentioned correctly. One, first you have to make a plan like your cyber crisis management plan. Once you made the plan, then you have to implement that plan. The third is uh, what I mentioned is about the drills that we carry out it actually tells you whether your plan is going to work or not and what is going to happen during a crisis. So if you actually follow all these things sincerely, you will start seeing where the gaps are and what you need to fill up. Question is making the right scenarios for these sort of drills. So whether you make them technology oriented or you make them domain oriented is the only question. So once you made them domain oriented and technology oriented, you will start seeing where the issues and uh, challenges are coming up so that you can start filling them up properly. So I'm not so gently being nudged to end the session, but gentlemen, thank you very much for a very engaging, very insightful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sakev and the luminary speakers for this insightful and relevant discussion in the context of fast-evolving digitization on cyber threats.